the, the Europeans have been going forward uh, with this in, um, in a lot of research and demonstration and development projects. Um, I think the U.S. is lagging a little behind. Uh, this may be sort of part of a race where uh, different continents are sort of um, placing money and bets on different uh, clean energy technologies. Um, you may know that um, Japanese firms, in particular the very large automotive firms, have for a long time sort of been talking about hydrogen and have been developing these uh, hydrogen transportation solutions uh, early on. So uh, altogether, the race is on, uh, and I guess we will see uh, in the course of time really how this is going to uh, play out. I want to talk to you today a little bit about um, really the economic side of hydrogen and different hydrogen solutions, what we know about it, how I uh, sort of look at this. And this is really ongoing um, work. Towards the end of my talk, if time permits, uh, I'll be, uh, I'll sort of sketch for you some of the work we're currently doing. Um, I find it quite exciting, uh, but this is really sort of fresh off uh, the press if you, if you want to. Um, <clears throat> if Rahil I've already mentioned, so I'm perfectly happy to make this a little more interactive. Um, um, do interrupt any, at any point in time. Uh, if, if I sort of can keep the talk halfway on track through the 45 minutes that we have, uh, that's, that's good. If, uh, if there are too many questions, I may sort of ask you to um, um, let me move forward a little faster. But uh, uh, I would like this to be interactive, so please, uh, please interrupt if you, if you want to. Okay, so let me then get started. Um, <clears throat> here is a, um, what you may call, background um, uh, slide uh, in which hydrogen does not yet play a major role. And this is sort of for a good reason. Um, those of you uh, who have really followed this discussion about decarbonization uh, intensely in the last couple of years may have seen, may have seen uh, this part uh, earlier um, or this slide earlier. It was uh, produced by Shell in 2019 and it's called the sky scenario. And um, let me first say right off, uh, I in no way want to sort of endorse this um, uh, trajectory. It's a projection, really, of carbon emissions over the next uh, so many uh, decades. Um, it's just a forecast that Shell made, and Shell, of course, being an oil and gas company, um, that is, however, investing actively um, in um, clean and new uh, energy solutions on a number of fronts. Um, so. What, what you can see there is they, they project that uh, emissions are going to be increasing uh, for a few more years, roughly till the middle of uh, the decade that just started. And then they're going to come down uh, and reach zero for the world. These are global carbon CO2 emissions um, by 2070, okay? And uh, you see um, in sort of the little icons suggest to you um, the um, energy technologies carriers that are going to get us to this trajectory. And the point to notice here is, yes, there is, um, when, you, when you look at the truck here, um, there is some hydrogen transportation, but overall you see at the very end here, even out uh, for the next 70 or 80 years, uh, Shell really projects that the role of hydrogen uh, in this new energy economy is going to be relatively small. So that's their forecast as of 2019. Um, the larger imp impact sort of our, our importance of this slide, in my mind, is that if you um, ask yourself, well, if Shell were right, <laughs> what would this do sort of to uh, the world's climate and where would this leave us collectively on this planet? The answer is not very good. Um, because if you add up all these annual emissions, so um, mathematically you take the area under this curve, the integral, and you add that all up as to the year 2070, you get to something like 1,200 gigatons, 1,200 billion tons of CO2 uh, and a, on a cumulative level. Now that is by uh, the literature that I read, way more than what most climate scientists tell us what we have left as a carbon budget. 
So uh, we better all hope that Shell is uh, not right with this forecast. Otherwise, we're going to, going to really blow through uh, the carbon budget that we are being told that we have if we want to keep uh, temperature increases to two degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial levels. Um, Shell better not be right. Um, and that, in my mind, reinforces the question, well, so um, would hydrogen deployed early and widely in a number of industries and in a number of sectors of the economy, could that make a contribution that would help us um, to really bend this curve down faster so that the total area would be more in line with the 700 gigaton budget uh, that people are talking about, okay? So um, from here more broadly, um, the questions that are sort of, um, you know, we face in this whole field, those of us who look at the energy transition from a climate change perspective is, um, is radical decarbonization within the next 25 to 30 years doable? What are the most cost-effective pathways to such a decarbonized econ energy economy? For this talk in particular, what role should hydrogen play uh, in this? Um, what policy support is required? Uh, when I mentioned early on, the Europeans are now sort of uh, not only with funding for demonstration projects, but also in uh, pricing schemes seem to sort of be favoring the deployment of, of hydrogen uh, to get that going early. So the policy aspect in my mind in all of this is, is crucial uh, if we're trying to make a forecast where things are going to go over the next couple of decades. And the last question in all of this um, is if the world sort of just goes on, um, makes improvements uh, as, we, as we go along, uh, but incremental improvements, is that going to be good enough to meet those decarbonization goals? Um, there are people um, like, uh, for instance, Bill Gates, who have sort of uh, said, you know, we need in all of this, we need technology breakthroughs. So my position on this technology breakthroughs would be great, but uh, let's first see if we um, do the kinds of improvements that we have seen uh, for renewables and that we are now also beginning to see for hydrogen, if those um, improvements continue at the same pace, roughly, so it wouldn't be a technology breakthrough, but incremental improvement, uh, would that still be consistent uh, with meeting the decarbonization goals and particularly staying within the carbon budget, uh, as we have seen uh, a moment ago on the last slide. So this whole, I will talk about change uh, technological improvements, but gradual ones. Uh, and then we can get in my mind to the question, do we need to uh, swing more for the fences? Do we need something radically new, a real breakthrough rather than just uh, incremental improvements? So here is um, a slide that uh, once again in the last, um, uh, I would say couple of years uh, has been shown a lot. I'm, I want to, to also show it here again. It's from a paper uh, published in Science with a lot of authors. It's actually a very short paper. It's one of those papers where the number of authors seems to be writing down the names of the authors seems to take more space than the paper itself. And the, the key thing in this um, uh, paper is really um, this slide or this picture, this pictorial that you see there, um, which is sort of a vision for what you may call a future hydrocarbon economy. Very different from the one that we see today. And um, you're seeing basically in green on the lower right-hand side here, um, you're seeing the supplies of um, energy. Um, that includes also a supply of CO2. Um, CO2 is sort of the red road that goes through this economy and there are takers, off takers for the CO2. Um, there's of course electricity in green, presumably from renewables or carbon free sources. Um, and there is a hydrogen path. Uh, here is hydrogen in blue. Um, and then in purple, you see the, the, the last uh, major freeway through this new economy. Um, these are basically the synthetic hydrocarbons in this economy that could be produced from hydrogen, um, carbon dioxide, oxygen, um, with the help of clean electricity. Um, 
And he, over here then is the demand side from air travel to uh, hospitals to uh, um, manufacturing. You see there are cement and steel. Um, so that's how this whole new economy would go, um, would have some features of the circular economy that people sort of talk about in which um, uh, these types of um, molecules are combined, emitted and combined uh, in, in a completely new way, which ultimately leaves emissions much, much smaller. So much for the vision. Now, there are also people who are saying, this is really, um, it's, it's a nice vision, um, but it's unrealistic. This is not going to happen. Um, so perhaps the most um, vocal critic of the whole hydrogen uh, approach and the vision of the hydrogen economy, if you want to, is none other than Elon Musk, uh, who of course nowadays has a lot of uh, credibility just on account of the success of his company, uh, Tesla. Um, so let me perhaps here ask uh, the, the group for a moment, if anybody wants to sort of chime in here, what is, um, what's Elon Musk's uh, criticism about um, <laughs> about hydrogen. Why does he not believe this is a viable path? He says that conversion efficiency is too low. Yes, I think. That's, that's his major beef. Uh, exactly right. So the conversion efficiency is low or the um, round trip efficiency losses, in particular, if you were to convert clean electricity to hydrogen and then go back in the other direction, you would be losing uh, ultimately a lot of uh, the energy that you have produced in the first place, so low conversions. Um, that point is valid at some level <laughs> uh, in that these conversion losses must be taken into consideration when we ask how competitive is it, um, and we'll do that in the calculations that I want to show you uh, in a moment. So um, something to keep in mind, but in my mind also not uh, the ultimate argument, you know, you could you could also argue with the, in the other direction. Look, uh, if renewables are becoming as cheap as they seem to be coming, um, and we're wasting most of the sunlight anyhow for the purposes of harnessing the energy from the sun, um, if then we can we have further losses, conversion losses as we go to go down the hydrogen route. So what if it's cheap to begin with? we might as well waste a portion of it because we're wasting 99.9% .9 of it any day, anyhow, um, because that much of the sun energy is not being absorbed or used by us. Okay, so um, here is perhaps my slide in which I'm uh, sort of talking a little bit about all the um, <clears throat> potential uses of hydrogen. Um, so the proponents say this could be a significant building block um, in this transition to phasing out fossil fuels. And what did they mention in particular? Well, one thing that we already have seen uh, in particular from uh, Japanese manufacturers uh, for uh, in, in certain spaces is the idea of hydrogen as a transportation fuel where you would basically do the power generation via fuel cells. And we have a number of established fuel cell manufacturers all over the world. Um, second, uh, usage um, for a scenario for hydrogen is blending it with natural gas and using the current infrastructure. And if you do that, then you would basically reduce the CO2 footprint of natural gas if you had the synthetic gas that's a mix of natural gas and, and hydrogen. Um, my colleagues tell me sort of how large the share of hydrogen could be if you want to use the current infrastructure of piping and um, say burners uh, for natural gas is sort of not entirely clear. This hasn't been pushed yet, but generally it would then be used for both power generation uh, and heating purposes, the hydrogen. Um, finally, the one that uh, I'm going to probably be speaking most about today, the idea of simply energy storage um, as a medium or as a hydrogen as an energy as a chemical energy storage medium, uh, both for large scale and for long term energy storage, to some extent a, an alternative to battery storage or other forms of um, uh, of long term storage. 
And finally, um, what I sort of showed you in this uh, uh, pictorial from science um, uh, for the new hydrocarbon economy, this idea that once we have uh, hydrogen and we have CO2, of which we obviously have too much at the moment, um, we could uh, produce all sorts of valuable um, hydrocarbon molecules, in particular synthetic gas, CH4. Um, this generally goes sort of under the heading power to X. Um, in other words, you have, you have power, you have um, hydrogen and um, other molecules uh, to combine, basically produce then a whole range of products uh, synthetically. So that's really sort of a long-term type of vision of which we, don't ha we haven't seen all that much so far. Okay, that was sort of a, that's the vision part. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment where we are today. So this is a um, slide that I have picked. You probably can see it if uh, you're seeing the same thing as I do on the screen, sort of blocked out because we have here the participants on the Zoom call on the right, but it's a slide from the International Energy Association, IEA. Um, and um, this has, this really shows you nothing more than um, the hydrogen that's being produced, where is it coming from and where is it going to? Um, and so on the left, you see the largest block here is um, natural gas uh, is being used as a feedstock to produce hydrogen, roughly 200 million tons and thereby the largest of all the sources. Um, this is sometimes goes under the heading steam methane reforming. Um, so hydrogen is being produced from natural gas in the process CO2 emissions arise. That's uh, why it's sort of considered dirty, quote unquote. Um, and uh, other uses are other fossil fuels like coal, oil, and the like. Um, there are also some production processes which produce several projects at the same time. So you see here hydrogen as a byproduct. Um, that's another bucket. On the right, you're seeing basically all the use cases um, or the industries that this is going to, say refining uh, for all sorts of refineries. Um, uh, the next category is pretty much fertilizer for agriculture, some into transportation, methanol, another um, useful molecule in a number of industrial processes and the like. So this is basically, where is it coming from? In most cases today, the feedstock is a fossil fuel, and here are the users. Now, depending on how sort of close you have followed this, there is sort of um, in this industry, or when people talk about hydrogen, there is sort of a color coding that's uh, popping up. Um, and uh, I'm never quite sure whether people use the same color labels. Um, you, you see I've written them down there at the bottom. Let me actually try this on this crowd. Um, gray, blue, green, or turquoise. Uh, turquoise is probably the, uh, the iffiest of those color labels. Uh, I've only heard this informally. I haven't seen it really written down. So just so that we get the language straight, uh, what do you associate or do you associate anything with these labels, say blue hydrogen versus green hydrogen or gray hydrogen? Anybody? Just I want to sort of get a little bit of sense of where, where this uh, group stands. Without having looked into it, uh, making the assumption green hydrogen coming from renewable sources versus gray coming from, uh, say, um, fossil fuels. Yeah. Not sure where to place blue, but uh, would assume something like natural gas byproduct. Um, yeah, so uh, absolutely right on gray and green. That's my interpretation too. Um, blue is... Um, uh, the way I understand it, and once again, I'm not entirely sure that the, the labels are being applied consistently, uh, but uh, that would actually be from fossil fuels, but with carbon capture. So the idea that you wouldn't have any CO2 emissions, and from a CO2 perspective, it would still be a clean carrier. Um, turquoise, as I said, is sort of a slightly newer label here. I'll introduce that uh, in a moment. That's basically going to be that's why the, the, the color label was chosen. That's going to be pretty close to actually green, which as you said, Tilo, is a combination where we're basically re relying on renewable energy in the first place um, uh, to make this. So turquoise is close to green, 
a slight variant of green. And I'll come back to that uh, when we look at some scenario. Okay, moving right along. So uh, we said this gray is what we have today, primarily steam reforming. Um, and that is sort of the way it has been uh, going for some time. In my mind, um, the big question to ask sort of as a first stage when we, before we get to the loftier questions of what is the role um, of hydrogen really going to be in, in the long-term future is um, do we have the clean energy alternatives like the green hydrogen or the turquoise hydrogen production processes? Are they already competitive in today's world with steam reforming? That is, do they have a chance to displace uh, it simply if investors didn't care much about CO2 emissions, they're just going to follow the trail of the money. They're going to make these investments uh, if they pan out. Um, if we did that, would that already be sort of, you know, an accomplishment uh, into, from a CO2 perspective? If we just did, we, we didn't widen the footprint of um, um, hydrogen in the economy, but we just replaced what's currently being done in terms of um, producing that valuable uh, raw material uh, hydrogen from a green source rather than going down the traditional path of relying on mostly on natural gas or other fossil fuels to do so. So question, how large is that footprint? You know, when I showed you the slide uh, a moment ago in terms of all the uses and the sources of it. So here's a little quiz question for you uh, written there on, um, on my first bullet point. Um, relate the CO2 emissions from global steam methane reforming across the world to the emissions of the entire German economy. I picked Germany again because I split, I spend a lot of my time there. So just orders of magnitude, how large is this? I'll guess two orders of magnitude larger. In, in which direction? Two X in, two, uh, uh, so <laughs> who is two times larger? The, the CO2 emissions from global steam methane reforming. Uh, okay, that would be, that would be really significant. So let's, order of magnitude, Germany's economy accounts for about 800 million tons of CO2, which is roughly 2% uh, of uh, the world's emissions. Um, so Dean, you're right in that it's larger. That's why I chose Germany as the benchmark, but it's not quite 2x. It's about 900, so slightly larger. So it's 1.1x if you want to. Okay. Um, but so, you know, that's significant. Uh, out of the, uh, you saw the, the, shell, the shell scenario early on, out of the 32 um, gigatons, billion tons of CO2 that the world has, steam methane uh, reforming uh, today is already 2%. So if we were to displace that, that would already make somewhat of a contribution. Okay. Question, is that going to happen? So, um, what are the alternatives? Um, the main alternative that's really on the block and that is being commercially practiced already today is um, electrolysis. Uh, you see it there. Uh, that's the green hydrogen, in particular if you rely on clean electricity to split water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen uh, by injecting uh, basically the electric power into the water. Uh, an alternative that's at the development stage by a number of large company is pyrolysis, um, which splits the methane, the CH4, directly into hydrogen and solid carbon, but wants to do so without releasing any of um, the carbon uh, or not letting any of the carbon react with the oxygen to produce CO2. That's uh, another alternative. Again, not yet um, a number of large companies in the world are uh, spending a fair amount of money on this, uh, but it isn't yet at a commercial stage in my, um, to, to the best of my knowledge. So the conventional wisdom is, and this has been true sort of for now for some time is, okay, this electrolysis is cool in that it's green. Um, it, if we have a lot of renewable power and the renewable power then gives us the hydrogen, um, then we avoid the emissions uh, and that would be sort of a really a, a classic clean energy technology in which we're putting renewables and all the progress we have made on renewables to good use. 
Um, but the conventional wisdom is, well, fine, but it doesn't withstand the market test. Um, natural gas in many parts of the world is cheap, particularly cheap in the US because of fracking. Um, so if you do, do the numbers to get one kilogram of hydrogen, which one uh, is going to be cheaper? Which one are going to investors, what type of facilities will investors be willing to um, really put their money on? The answer is the traditional steam methane reforming steel still wins. And so electrolysis isn't quite positioned competitively. That has been true for the longest time. Um, my, our numbers, the work that we're doing, show us that this is actually changing. It's changing relatively quickly, and it's now a real race. Um, and so it isn't sort of a done deal yet in my mind in favor of green hydrogen, uh, but it's getting very close and it's changing uh, in the right direction from, from, from uh, sort of my preference perspective on this one. Okay. Um, so what has, what has contributed to these changes? Uh, first one, um, we all know renewable electricity, renewable power is becoming very cheap, very, very quickly. Uh, probably both solar and wind have seen sort of spectacular cost declines. Um, with in, in some of the uh, auctions, I saw a report the other day that um, uh, the first time uh, we actually for sun for solar PV uh, got to the point of a PPA, a power purchasing agreement, with a bidder at an auction to one cent per kilowatt hour in Portugal recently. Um, uh, I, I know was my reaction too. Uh, you know, when, when I heard two cents in certain parts of the world, I thought, boy, that's, uh, that is already a, a record one cent. Um, I also had a hard time sort of rationalizing. But even if it's two cents, you know, uh, this is very low, very close to zero. We obviously won't be go able to go below zero. Uh, but sort of think about now the clean electricity um, part being very cheap. Electrolyzers have also uh, improved uh, because more of them have been produced. So this is sort of a, a learning curve concept that I want to talk about in a moment. And the last part, and this is really sort of the one that I think most people um, in the popular press are not paying attention to, that I want to sort of um, at least give you as an intuition. I don't know whether it will be possible for me to fully explain it, is um, wholesale power markets largely because of what has been happening to renewables, have become a lot more volatile in terms of prices. In other words, the prevailing price on, say, a wholesale market in California or in Texas or uh, on the East Coast or in Europe, um, the trend that we have seen over the last couple of years is, or the last 10 years almost, is that um, Average prices have come down per kilowatt hour, again, wholesale, not, not retail, wholesale. But at the same time, um, the fluctuations in prices across the day, across the hours of the year, has gone up and has gone up dramatically. So that volatility in prices, so again, think of the price at um, late in the afternoon, you know, here in California. Um, as you can imagine, the late afternoon price in the summer is sort of the super high price because industry is still working. Um, people are um, cranking up their air conditioning units. Um, that's the time when you really pay premium for power in the wholesale market. Uh, and vice versa, um, at uh, five in the morning or 10 in the morning or even now at noontime with a lot more solar, these prices tend to be much, much lower. And these fluctuations, this volatility has been increasing. And that is in this whole economics of hydrogen, volatility is a good thing. Um, usually, you know, in, in economics and in finance, we worry about volatility. It's something that investors, market participants don't like, but here it actually goes in your favor. So the more, the larger the fluctuations, um, the better the positioning 
of some of these uh, uh, technologies like electrolysis uh, or other types of fuel cells in the hydrogen market. Okay, so I, I realize that this may sort of sound a little counterintuitive at this point. I'll just sort of throw it in there as a thought. And if um, time permits, I'll sort of uh, try to show this a little uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So here is a um, simple picture of um, an electrolyzer. Uh, this is actually a so-called PEM electrolyzer. Uh, I think I have the labels here on the next slide. The proton electrolyte membrane, sometimes also called proton exchange membrane. That's the type of electrolyzer that has come up in recent years uh, sort of more prominently. You see here a couple of firms that are in this space. Um, it has replaced the traditional um, uh, AEL uh, electrolyzer. Uh, at the very end, if I uh, have the time, I'll talk a little bit about so-called uh, an alternative to this um, uh, type of electrolyzer, the PEM electrolyzer, called the solid oxide cell electrolyzer. What is important about this one is, you see this here in, in this uh, sub-bullet point, it is a fuel cell that can run in both directions. That is, it can run from, as an electrolyzer, um, convert electricity and water into hydrogen and oxygen, but you can also go in the opposite direction. You can use it really as a fuel cell. If you are combining hydrogen, um, you're getting, uh, or if you're using hydrogen and oxygen, you're getting uh, power and, uh, power and um, water back. Uh, in, in the other direction. Why is that important? Well, all of these from an economic perspective, all of these technologies, of course, are very capital intensive. They cost a lot of money. The variable cost of operating them is relatively low. The raw materials, if you want to that go into this production process, are relatively cheap. So if you have something like a solid oxide cell that can run in both directions, depending on what the market constellation tells you, you're really, um, you're, you're sort of in business, so to speak, because you get much higher utilization of your expensive capacity. In all of these uh, technologies, whether it's uh, uh, here electrolysis or something else, it always, at the end of the day, when you ask, is this going, is this going to pencil out? Is this something that sort of can withstand the market test at the moment? The key thing is utilization of your capacity, of your expensive capacity. And if you have that, you're good. And here, the solid oxide cell, which at any point in time can either can run in either direction, has an inherent advantage over the traditional PEM electrolyzers that the world has sort of been looking at, okay? So here's a slide that if I were to show this over in the business school, probably most people would uh, say, ah, oh, sure. Um, uh, it really speaks to nothing more than the price development for so-called PEM electrolyzer. So again, this is the, the workhorse at the moment of this industry um, uh, for the proton exchange membrane. And what you see here is a graph um, that shows on one axis the cumulative output uh, measured in kilowatts, that is the, the power absorption capacity of your electrolyzer. Um, and over on this axis, you see the market price in 2018 dollars. Um, this is a chart that my um, Institute in, in, in Germany and I sort of, uh, we, we worked on this recently for a presentation. Um, uh, and you have here also a couple of years when so much output had been produced all the way through 2019 through the end of last year. And the bottom line we conclude here is a so-called 86% uh, learning curve over this time period from 2004 through 2019. So let me pause here perhaps for a moment. Um, what's the importance of these learning curves? They have actually been um, looked at in a number of industries, also outside energy, say in general with silicon uh, processes. Uh, what is one trying to capture here? 
again, depending on your background, this, you may have never seen this, but uh, some of you also may. Um, people in, uh, in business schools and technologists sort of stare at them all the time. In general, efficiency gains as you gain experience with something. So I think you have this very similar trend in automotive. As uh, the numbers go up, the prices tend to fall. Quite a lot of models on so exponential um, decline. So we were talking about this learning curve um, and um, basically price reductions uh, that the industry has been able to uh, um, achieve in terms of for how much these electrolyzers are sold per kilowatt of power uh, that the electrolyzer can absorb over time. And um, uh, Tilo brought in this concept of an exponential curve. So there is something exponential here. You see on both axes, um, the volume of output and the prices are um, drawn actually on a logarithmic scale. So the opposite of the exponential. And um, when you get to this, um, when you sort of do the, the linear regression through your pr actual price curve, you come to an estimate that says every time you double your output, um, the cumulative output of this particular um, PEM electrolyzer technology that has been built now for a number of years, the price has been falling by 14%. Uh, in other words, it is only 86% of what it was before you doubled your output. And this happens with every doubling of output. This goes further. So this is, of course, a relatively short uh, interval here of only 15 years. For solar PV, we have been able to study this for 40 years. And the learning is actually has been faster. It has been something like an 80 or even 70% learning curve. In other words, on average, with every doubling of output, um, the cost has gone down by 20%, here only by 14% because it's an 86% learning curve. So it's always the complement, okay? That's really important when you do the projections uh, as to where hydrogen sort of stands today and um, really, uh, uh, how much, um, how much in terms of cost and um, pricing improvements we're likely to see uh, for the, these types of technologies in the market in the coming years. So uh, in particular, um, the, we talked earlier green hydrogen. The idea here is, and this has been sort of done now in connection with PEM electrolyzers, is you may want to actually not just do what you see on this slide, um, by install an electrolyzer if you use hydrogen uh, by tapping on the, on the, uh, into the electricity market. I call this sort of new color neutral hydrogen, but that it may make sense, and this is this idea of volatility in prices again, to actually do a vertically integrated system in which you're combining a renewable power source, be it wind or solar, with your electrolyzer. Um, and then you either sell your output from the renewable source to the power market, if you can, or and your, um, uh, the output, your, your hydrogen, you're selling to the hydrogen units on the hydrogen market. So if you do that, then the critical question will be, how do you scale these two things in proportion to each other? The trade-off is going to be um, the renewable energy source will only run at certain times because of the intermittency and wind of wind and solar. Um, and then you can feed your electrolyzers cheap electricity, okay? Um, if the prices are very high, it may be better to make actually money in the, in the electricity market. So you're starving your electrolyzer. An alternative to that is that you really go a step further, and this is where I come to turquoise hydrogen, is that you actually do exactly what, we what I just described a moment ago, but in addition, you open yourself up to the electricity market so that at certain times, you still um, 
feed your electrolytes, right? Remember, this is expensive equipment that you don't want to starve at any point in time. Um, so you're also opening up to yourself to the electricity market uh, during certain hours when your renewable source is actually not producing electricity. So this is turquoise because it relies mostly, mostly on green uh, uh, power, green electricity, but not exclusively. And this angle here turns out to make really a large difference. So with an eye on the time, I'm going to uh, go right to um, the whole following question. What are in today's environment, the break even prices? In other words, if you invest in one of those electrolysis processes, um, how much must you be able to sell hydrogen for per kilogram so that you're making money on this, okay? So it has a, what we call um, uh, over in, on the, in the business school, what we call a, a positive pr net present value. That is your investment is, um, is paying off for investors. That minimum price at which you're breaking even will call the break even price. And that determines um, if you now benchmark this against prevailing prices for hydrogen from steam methane reforming, um, whether your technology is cost competitive. So what do we find? Here is, um, you unfortunately not seeing the whole slide, uh, a comparison where we are uh, really looking at Germany versus Texas, and we're looking at wind energy. Uh, again, Texas being a market with a lot of price volatility, also high saturation of wind power. Germany, also a fair amount of wind power, not quite as high in terms of the, the percentage uh, generation. And the interesting thing is the best, the lowest break-even prices that makes things the most competitive, you get in both cases for this integrated system. So that's the turquoise hydrogen. Um, while if you only rely on green, on renewables, you see you're having quite uh, a drop off here. So it really helps to not, in, in, to put this sort of in a, in a slightly flat, um, a coarse way, if you insist on green hydrogen, um, you have your work carved out for yourself. If you're willing to compromise and say, yes, I'm building this renewable source, and at the same time, I'm also relying on the power market, um, at certain times to feed electricity to the ele electrolyzer, your numbers are going to get a little, a lot better. So in effect, these numbers here, the $2.59, uh, the two euros and 59 cents per kilogram, or in Texas, 244, <coughs> they put us already in the range of what hydrogen sells for nowadays, even for large scale hydrogen supply. So this is just on the verge of becoming cost competitive uh, in the traditional hydrogen market that's, as I said at the beginning, is nowadays largely based on uh, steam methane reforming. As a last thought on this, so this is going to get better for the reasons I, that I had indicated. And as a last thought, I mentioned these um, solid oxide cells, the reversible power to gas um, uh, or the reversible fuel cells. There, the interesting thing is they are much newer, they're much more expensive, but they can also run in both directions. If we, we recently did the numbers on this, and we're getting actually to a value now of $2.60 per kilogram in Texas, so that's pretty close. It's not quite as good yet, but this is the new kid on the block here, so to speak. These guys are going to, my prediction is these guys are going to do a lot better in the coming years, and that's why there's a lot of enthusiasm to build these. Uh, and go down that same learning curve that the others have. So when all is said and done, this remains an open race, but I, my take it is, um, on it is uh, hydrogen is well positioned in this. Uh, and it may, uh, of the many use cases, it may carve out quite a few slots uh, in the transportation area, also as an open storage medium. Uh, we're already getting close at it as it is, and this is a technology or a group of technologies that are relatively young. Um, so if we fast forward another 10 years, this could really grab a significant slice of the overall pie uh, in, in terms of um, uh, these uh, clean energy uh, technologies.
I end with a quote from uh, the chair of the International Hydrogen Association. I actually agree at the end of the day. I think our numbers support this. The, the coming decade may be for hydrogen what the 1990s were for wind and solar. Um, there is a lot of indication that this may play out in a similar fashion with the same dramatic results.